What's up, guys? Welcome back to another daily Bible reading snapshot. Today we're looking at 1 Kings 8 and 9. And what we see in today's daily Bible reading is the beginning of Solomon using this temple for the glory of God. Because what he's doing so far has just been building it. Now they're finally starting to use it. So this is seven years after they started. It says he grabbed everybody, all the elders, all the, the tribal heads, everybody who was anybody was there at the Temple Mount on this first day. And they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the temple and they were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that it wasn't even counted or numbered. They didn't even keep track because it was just so much sacrifice that they were giving to God because this was a big, important day. And I really like how Solomon prays here and most of the chapter is Solomon's prayer. So you might notice that chapter 8 is really long and that's because most of the chapter is dedicated to Solomon's prayer here. And in verse 12, he starts out um, talking about the temple, even before the prayer, he says, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I indeed have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. And you might be thinking, uh-oh, this guy thinks that he made God a house, and oh, that means he thinks he's pretty great and awesome. He's put God in a box. Well, look at verse 23. After he starts praying, here's what he says. O Lord God of heaven, there is no God like you in heaven above, or on earth beneath, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You've kept with your servant David, my father, what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand you fulfilled this day. And he goes on, you're thinking, oh, oh, he's all about himself here. Is that what's going on? Verse 27. He says, but God will, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Will God really be contained to this earth? I don't think so. Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I've built. And that you get the right perspective. He, he's After he's praising God and saying how great God is, it might be confusing to some people. Like, is Solomon just doing this for himself? Well, he says, even this great this house, this great temple, God cannot be contained by it. So we see that Solomon has the correct view of God. A view of God that a lot of people today don't have. That God is transcendent, which means God is above everything. Totally outside of our control of, of trying to put God in, in thoughts and boxes and all that stuff. It says, no, God cannot be contained to any location. God's presence goes out through all the earth. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all the time. His special presence, though, we would love for that to be at this temple. And that's what most of this prayer is about. First of all, he says, he asks God, hey, if someone prays to this location and at this location, please hear them. Please answer their prayer. Please give special attention to the people that are in this building. Please. That would be really great if you did that. He even says in verse 46, If your people sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you're angry with them and you give them away to an enemy, so that they're carried away captive to the land of their enemy, far off or near, yet if they turn with their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent, and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned and acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies, who have been carried, who carried them captive, and pray to you towards their land, which you have given to their fathers, the city that you have chosen, and to the house that I have built for your name, then in heaven, hear your dwelling place, your, their prayer and their plea. So he says, God, please listen. Please listen to their prayer. And I want you to think, who was the original audience of this book? Who was hearing this? It was a group of people in exile who were turning their hearts back to the Lord. So Solomon's prayer basically gives them a template for what to pray for when they're in exile. I just want you to see that's a really cool connection we need to make. I think that's one of the reasons this prayer is given so much um, detailed length here that God allowed these people in exile to get this prayer to say, wow, this is what we need to do. We need to respond to God in faith and turn back to him in repentance. So he says at the end of this prayer, and this really the benediction, so to speak, the thing he says at the end, he says in verse 56, this is Solomon talking, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he has promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promise which he spoke by Moses' his servant. I just want you to think how amazing that is. Not one single little promise failed to come to pass. God was faithful completely to everything he said. But now are the people going to be faithful? 
Are they going to be faithful to do this? Well, the story, you already kind of know where it's going. If these people are going to end up in exile, they're not going to be faithful to God. So chapter 8 is all about that. Um, Chapter 9, God speaks to Solomon, has an encounter with him, and he reaffirms with him his, his pressure that he puts on Solomon. You need to obey me. Even when it's hard, you need to obey me. You need to trust me. You need to serve me. And Solomon basically agrees, but then we're going to see the rest of the acts of Solomon. He's doing all these amazing things and amazing, he's going to amazing places and people are bringing him all this stuff. And we're going to see what happens in the next chapters, whether or not Solomon really keeps the word of God like he said he would. So that's today's daily Bible reading. Some super important stuff in the book of Kings, specifically 1 Kings 8. But now we're looking at the story here at the end of Jesus's earthly ministry. And what I mean by that is we've got a couple more minutes, a couple more moments left of Jesus's life before he gives up his spirit. What we're turning our attention to is Jesus on the cross with these criminals, one on either side, and they're making fun of Jesus. One of them is mocking Jesus and the other one steps in and says, do you not fear God? We are condemned. We should be here, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he turns to Jesus and asks Jesus, Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I don't know what you expect Jesus to say, but especially after yesterday's DBR and all the amazing promises of forgiveness that Jesus is making, you probably know what he's going to do. He turns to this criminal and says, today you will be with me in paradise. He forgives him of his sin because we've got a repentant person, a person who, yeah, is being punished for their sins in some sense, but will be ultimately forgiven, kind of like those people in the exile. We got people in the exile, back from our Old Testament reading, who are being punished for their sin, but if they turn with their whole heart, they can be forgiven. There's a lot of people right now who might feel like God is is giving them the, the fruit that they deserve from their sin, and that's probably true, but they can be forgiven today if they repent with their whole heart and trust in the Lord. They can be forgiven of all their sins, and if that's you, you can be forgiven of all your sins. If you've not turned to God in full submission and repentance, you can be forgiven of your sins, just like this thief on the cross can. God is willing to forgive you. And that's what's amazing. Right now, as you have an opportunity, you have the opportunity to respond to God in repentance and faith. And I would just urge you, please take that opportunity. This guy had only a few moments. Don't know how long you're going to have, but you need to make sure that you are right with God by turning from your sin and trusting your whole heart to Jesus Christ, who's able to forgive your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and to give you newness of life. So uh, that's important for every single person. That's important for you to think through today as we study the death of Jesus and the repentance of the thief. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you back tomorrow for another daily Bible reading snapshot.